All right, well, looks like we're running a little late today. I lost track of time there. So if you got your Bibles with you this morning, we're starting a new, a new study, a new series on uh, spiritual leadership. And uh, we're going to start out, the first verse we're going to look at is Psalm 119, verse 2. But while you're getting there, let's go ahead and pray and ask God's blessing on our time here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for loving us. Father, I just thank you for once again being able to assemble together here in your house, Lord. I thank you for the men who are here this morning. Father, I thank you for the visitors that we have. And Lord, I just pray that they would be blessed with the hearing and teaching of your word. And that, Father, that all of us would be, Lord. I just, I just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts open our minds open the eyes of our understanding lord that we can uh, begin to see what you're wanting to do in our lives and father i pray for myself lord that you would uh, give me the words to say the father would be glorifying to you and edifying to us and i ask this in jesus name amen, amen. so psalm 119.2 says blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Being a spiritual leader starts with the heart attitude of love and respect for God and the Word of God. So this first part of our of our study here is entitled The Heart of a Leader. Psalm 119.10 says, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. The heart attitude will then naturally be followed with a love for God's people. If you go to Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 says, For a bishop, any spiritual leader, but the Bible says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker not given to filthy lucre. So, in verse 7 there, Titus, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, gives us a list of things that we need to look at as spiritual leaders. That, first off, we must be blameless. Now, I want you to understand that blameless and sinless are two totally different things. There's only one that ever lived sinless, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. But to live blameless is one who, when they make a mistake, corrects that mistake. Invoke 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 where it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's being blameless. It says that we must be blameless as the steward of God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a steward of God. So we have to keep ourselves clean. And it says not self-willed. That means we're not promoting ourselves. Not soon angry. I don't think I need to explain that. Not given to wine. No striker. Don't be going around hitting people. Not given to filthy lucre. In other words, you don't serve God for the money's sake. You do it because you love God and you love the Word of God. Remember, we're talking about being a biblical 
spiritual leader. All right. Verse 8. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. I want to make note of the fact that it says a lover of hospitality. We need to be friendly to one another. We need to be open to uh, receiving one another and being kind. And then it says a lover of good men. Good men. There's some people, quite frankly, that are not good men. We don't have to love them like we do the good men. There's a, there's a difference in the way that we treat people. If somebody's evil, we treat them as evil. We'll get into that later on in the study. The just, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. In other words, you live by the word of God that you know. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So we do, we convince people, we exhort people and convince people by sound doctrine, which means we must know the sound doctrine of the Word of God so that we can minister to others. So everything in the life of a Christian begins in the heart. And there's nowhere that that is more evident than in a spiritual leader. I don't know if you've ever been around a mean preacher, <laughs> one that has a that doesn't have a heart for people, but they're really hard to deal with. I've had the misfortune of being in that situation a couple of times, and it's not good for anybody involved. So over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at all these things that we just discussed here in this lesson. We're going to start today with looking at two things. Today we're going to look at the call to leadership and the commands of leadership. So once we get these established today, we'll look at the character of the leader next week. And then over the next several weeks, we're going to break down uh, the complete spectrum of spiritual leadership. So we're going to start right now with looking at the call to leadership. Spiritual leaders are not appointed by man. They are called by God. We need to certainly understand that. Man doesn't call somebody to be a spiritual leader. God does. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now you read that verse and you think, well, that's not a very uh, becoming call to become a spiritual leader. I mean, it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So being a spiritual leader comes with a price. Verse 9 says, Who hath saved us, talking about the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, 
which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Began. So what I really want us to understand this morning is that the calling of God is not for your prestige and pleasure, but for His purpose and plan. God had a purpose for you before the foundations of the world. Before He created anything, He had it all figured out. That's the, that's the uh, important thing to understand about God. God knows the beginning from the end. And He knows everything in between. It's called His foreknowledge. God knows it all. Has always known it all. And his plan before the foundations of the world was to save man and to give man the ministry of reconciliation so that we could lead other people to him so that he could save them. So when you read your Bible and you see where God created man in the garden and then Satan comes along and deceives them and man goes into sin, and sometimes you look at that and you go, well, man, God didn't have this planned out very well. Yes, He did. See, He knew that was going to happen before the creation. But He had a plan. And He had a purpose for man. So a true spiritual leader must have a heart of love and compassion for people which is generated by love for God and the Word of God. It's not a self-willed desire for position of prominence and power. So there are five Greek titles that define the office of a spiritual leader found in the New Testament. Now, these all intersect with each other, interact with each other. They're all interchangeable with each other. And I didn't put them in any particular order here except for the last one. So the first one, the Greek word is deraskalos. You find it in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 28 and 29. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 28 and 29. Verse 28 says, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities, of tongue. You see that where it says thirdly teachers? That's our word. The Greek word deraskalos is teacher. The next one is episcopus. You find that in Acts chapter 20. And verse 28. Now this isn't the only places you find these words. This is just the ones that we're using today. Acts 20, 28. And I was in 21 and it wasn't working at all. Acts 20 and verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. There's your word, overseers. To feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. That word <coughs> is also translated as a bishop. A bishop and an overseer. 
The next word is keruk. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.11 says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Our word there is preacher. Keruk. The next one is presbuteris. Presbuteris. 1 Timothy 5.17 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders, that's your word right there, press Buteris, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And then that brings us to our fifth one, which is poimain. Poimain. So go to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now I put that one last, on purpose, because I wanted to take a few moments for teaching you a little something about using a concordance and when you're studying the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, the word flock is the Strong's number 41, the Strong's concordance number 4168. It is a derivative of 4167, which means flock or fold. Now stay with me because this it's, it's interesting. So that, that word 4167, which is a flock or a fold, is a contraction of the word that is the Strong's number 4165, which is the word feed that you see there in the very first word of verse 2, feed the flocks. Alright? So that word comes from 4166, which is our word, shepherd. And it is also translated as pastor in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, which we're going to look at here in a minute. So you say, well, why did you go through all that motions? Because I wanted you to understand how the Bible works. A shepherd feeds the flock in any language. So in order to get to the shepherd, we have to go back and look through the words. Here in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, we have to go and look through the words of what these words mean, what they're translated from to get to the shepherd. But if you look at what it says, it says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Remember we looked at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, and, and that's we're overseers, we're bishops. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. That's a shepherd. Even though that verse doesn't say shepherd, that's a shepherd. That's what a shepherd does. Is a shepherd feeds the flock.
God in His uniqueness put the Bible together so that we would have to do what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, Study to shear thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God wrote the Bible so that we would work at it to fully understand it. God doesn't like lazy Christians, and especially lazy leaders. So spiritual leadership requires fulfilling those five responsibilities that we just looked at in the church of Jesus Christ. While you may or may not fill every office or position within your local church as a leader in that church, you carry the same responsibilities as the men filling the positions. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have the responsibility the same as the pastor or a deacon or anybody else in the church in leadership. God did not save anybody to keep a pew warm, to take up space in the church. Amen. So take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to just look at verses 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, And He gave some. So God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The church is not a one-man operation. Right, amen. The church is a functioning body where every member is critical. The reason that we do the discipleship that we do in this church is so that every one of us has the same mindset, the same basic understanding of the Word of God so that we work together as one. Because that's what the body's supposed to do. And there's not anybody in this building that's any more important than anybody else in this building. We have different positions. We have different callings. But every one of us is critical to the church functioning properly. Spiritual leadership requires sacrificial living which quite frankly is why there is such a void of spiritual leaders in the church today. It just costs too much. Luke chapter 14 Verses 25 through 30. I want to talk to you a little bit about the cost of it. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25 says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What's Jesus saying there? Is he saying that you should hate your children and your children should hate you? No. What he's saying is, I must be first. Yes. 
And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 28. For which of you until, intending to build a tower setteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. I'm going to tell you something, friends. I went through what was known, what we called in the church that I was in at the time, the Shepherd School of the Ministry. It was four years, every Saturday morning, of Bible teaching, Bible training. There was a lot of the people that I started out with that didn't make it through the four years. There was also a lot of people that made it through all four years and never did a thing with it because they didn't count the cost before they started building the tower. And when they got in the building process, progress, process, they realized they didn't have sufficient to finish it. There's a cost. There's a cost. The Christian life is not going to be judged by how you start but on how you finish. Finish strong. I don't think there's any of us in this room that came to Jesus Christ being holy and pure with no faults, with no problems. We didn't start out real good, but we can finish strong. The Apostle Paul was a killer. He hated Christians. Had them put to death. Had them put in prison. Yeah. He didn't start out very good, did he? But he finished strong. That's why he tells his son in the faith, Timothy, and, Ch and 2 Timothy, Chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. He says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul said, I didn't start out very strong, but I built up momentum as I went. And I finished strong, man. I got a crown of righteousness waiting on me. Amen. But it wasn't a crown of righteousness just for Him. It's for all of them also that love His appearing. Yes, it is. Who or what do you love most? That's the question that each and every one of us must answer. To be a strong spiritual leader, the answer must be God. That's why Jesus said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
we as leaders, as born again believers in Jesus Christ, must put God first. Amen. If we don't, we have no right to call ourselves His disciples. Because He just told us we can't be. We can be saved. We can go to heaven. There's not going to be a crown of righteousness waiting on us. So let's talk about the commands of leadership. That was the character of the leader. Now the commands of leadership. The commands for spiritual leadership are simple as laid out for us in Scripture. It is a command to lead, to serve, to pastor, to oversee, to feed, to shepherd, to be living examples of the grace of God to the people of God. A spiritual leader is one who can say with conviction, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If you can't say that to people with conviction, there's something in your life you need to fix. And that's what Paul said to the church of Corinth. That's my testimony to you. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If I fail to follow Christ, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. First Peter chapter 5, we were just there, verses 1 and 2. So the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. As leaders, we are to watch over and feed God's flock because we love God. Right, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We've already looked at this one too, but I want to remind you of it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. Notice it says to feed the flock of God, the church of God. So we're to feed the flock as pastors, as preachers, as leaders. We are not called to fleece the flock of God. We're not to do it for filthy lucre's sake. We do it because we love God and we love the Word of God. I'm telling you, if somebody is doing it for any other reason, they're doing it for the wrong reason. That is a world of responsibility to feed and to give oversight to God's blood-purchased possession. Take it seriously. Because He does. He takes it very seriously. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 3, another command. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. In samples. An ensample is something that is witnessed live. From within, you might say. It's from personal experience. An example, an example, is something that you see out there someplace else. Some bad examples sometimes. Sometimes good. But an ensample is something that is witnessed from within. 
So he's telling the leaders, neither as being lords over God's heritage, it's God's heritage, it's not mine, it's not yours, it's God's, but being in samples to the flock. In other words, as leaders, we have to be very, very careful how we live our lives. Because we're telling people to watch us, to emulate us. It's a lot of responsibility. When you stop and, and put it in the context of it's God's people. He purchased the church with His own blood. He owns it. He owns it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says, But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The goal of every spiritual leader must be for others to see Christ in them. We are to be a living, walking example of the life of Christ. 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Look, we cannot be an example to others of the love of God if our focus is on us. If it's all about me, you're not seeing Christ in me. Jesus gave us clear guidance on this subject as well. In John chapter 13, Verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. How did Jesus love you? He gave His life for you. He shed His blood for you. So how are we to love one another? With that same heart attitude. You first, and then me. Verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So that is being an example to the flock and not lording over them. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was perfect and sinless. And yet, in His earthly ministry, He loved people. He had compassion for people. He did not lord over people. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He came to earth to seek and to save those who was lost. He gave His life for His enemies. We're called Christians. Christians. The name Christian when it was first coined, was a derogatory term. It means a little Christ, or Christ in you. They was first called Christians at the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch was teaching that we as believers in Jesus Christ have Christ in us and us in Him. What they was teaching was the Word of God. And so people didn't like this, 
And so they started calling them Christians. Oh, you're a little Christ. You know what? They was right. They was right. We do have Christ in us. Amen. We are to live our lives like little Christ. Take your Bibles and go to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, watch this, that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. That's our future, man. That's why verse 3 is in there. It says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You and thank You for loving us. Father, I thank You for Your Holy Word. Father, I thank You for Your Holy Spirit. I thank You for Your Son, Jesus, who bled and died for me, a sinner. That I might be saved. And then, because of Your grace, You gave me the calling to the ministry, to the pastorate. And I thank You for that, Lord. I thank You for Your Holy Spirit that teaches me the Word of God and enables me to share that Word with others. And Father, as we, as we go through this study, this is just the introduction, but as we go through this study, Lord, I just pray that You would continue to feed my spirit. That You would continue to grow me in my relationship with You and my relationship with Jesus Christ. So that, Father, I can, I can teach these things to the men of this church. That we can all grow together to be the spiritual leaders that You want us to be. Father, You have Your work cut out for You. Because we're a mess. But help us, Lord. Help us to grow, to be more like Jesus every day. We ask this in His holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.